during my first year of seminary at Christian Theological Seminary in Indianapolis, I was cast in the part of Jesus in the musical Godspell. It's a good way to start seminary. <clears throat> we uh, decided to perform it during the Christmas season at the repertory theater that was then a part of CTS. How many of you have ever seen Godspell? I thought so. What was your favorite part? Well, next to getting crucified on the fence and singing, Oh God, I'm dying in a key way out of my range, precariously perched on a uh, troublesome uh, stool, I like the part at the beginning where the cast comes bouncing in and they put on the makeup and they pull brightly colored costumes while calling on God, all the while calling on God to save the people from despair. Let them not pass like weeds away their heritage, a sunless day. God save the people. So there he is, Jesus of God's spell, standing at an intersection, calling on God's justice to meet him right there on the stage. And if you remember what Cornel West said about justice, that justice is what love looks like in public, then you can see justice being played out on the stage, justice with a light touch in the funny bits about the parables and vaudeville routines. Meanwhile, elsewhere in the seminary, I was learning in my New Testament class about the Gospel of Matthew. And there I was experiencing Jesus quite differently. Differently than the one I certainly was playing at, dressed up as a clown. But to be honest, in that gospel, as you remember, Jesus comes off as a bit of a scold. As a bully, really, says Warren Carter. A teacher of righteousness disguised as a drill sergeant. Justice being administered as if it were a chastening rod, freely casting people around into darkness where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. Best to learn your lessons well, sings the Godspell. In Matthew, at the intersection where Jesus and justice meet at the end of time, there is a judgment seat where a red-faced Christ, as I imagine it, not made up, with a gavel in hand, is surrounded by frowning angels, not a cast of smilers. Now, for those of you preaching from the Gospel of Matthew this year, you're welcome. <laughs> but in God's spell, Jesus sings with the cast of building a beautiful city, beautifully rendered by Kyle Miller Shawnee just now. The singers stand in the ruin and the rubble of the present, and they draw a line along one pale, thin ray towards that beautiful city that lies in the future somewhere, where one hopes and prays that humanity, all of humanity, a city of all, will be thriving. But these days, I have a hard time catching a glimpse of that beautiful city. It's clouded by smoke. My vision is clouded by the smoke rising from the fires in Australia, from the smoking guns regularly turning up in this impeachment trial, from the barrels of automatic weapons in the aftermath of a school shooting. Now, some of you who like to attend the Festival of Homiletics that meets in different cities around the country, in 2021, it's going to be meeting in in Denver, and I've been asked to preach. Guess, guess what the theme is? Preaching for the future city. It seems that, Joe, we're moving toward quickly toward the topic of eschatology on your map. And we're being called upon as preachers to visualize the future. A future we hope and pray will be better 
Yeah, better, but, but for whom? And better for what purpose? When the preacher tri- rises to preach on this, she or he or they better have something to say. Usually, when we preach about a better future, we are doing so in the context of a story, says my storytelling friend Doug Lippman. A particular story, in fact. It's a story that our Western society has believed for quite some time. It's a story of progress. That human history is, in fact, shaped into an arc, and as Dr. King said, an arc that bends toward justice. And the rapid development of technology supports that story. In my lifetime, I've gone from, my, from catching my grandmother in the act of picking up the phone to overhear the gossip on the party line, to having our very own phone, to having my very own extension in my bedroom as a teenager. to putting my dissertation on record-side floppy disks for use when I'd sign up for a time on a computer that would fit into a small bedroom. Moving from that size of a computer to having my very own desktop and then laptop, to having more memory than God on a computer I can hold in my hand. I hope that wasn't blasphemous. My grandfather once explained to me, son, this tractor is better than the mule for pulling the plow. But granddaddy, I like that mule. But you see, the tractor ran on an eternal combustion engine. Engines that someday might very well turn electric. But for now, look at what the internal combustion engine is doing to our environment. In our social world, capitalism is better than feudalism, which is better than slavery, but capitalism itself is broken. And we have a hard time because of the story that we're embedded in of imagining anything else. The power, the dominant story of progress is that strong that we can't imagine anything else. But listen to what Ursula Le Guin said when she received a Lifetime Achievement Award at the 65th National Book Awards in 2014. She said, we live in capitalism. Its power is inescapable, it seems. But so did the divine right of kings. Any human power can be resisted and changed by human beings. So with that in mind, I was once in a guided meditation where the leader of the meditation said, when you dream the future, what is it that you see? Well, it took a while, but soon an image began to float up in my mind's eye. It was the image of a city in the distance. I told my partner that I was working on the exercise with that I couldn't tell much about that city, but it seemed to be a city elevated above the earth. The details of the city were certainly not as clear as the one revealed by to John of Patmos in the book of Revelation. But it didn't seem, in my imagination, dim or dirty, as one might imagine if you were reading a dystopian novel. I, But I couldn't tell if it was a beautiful city, only that it was lively and energetic. And I certainly couldn't tell if in that city there would be an intersection where Jesus' way met Justice Street, or if there was only a Jesus place in a cul-de-sac in a gated community. So the guide continued in the meditation In your dream of the future, what does the way towards it look like? I saw a narrow road. No surprise there, because as a child, I memorized a verse. Again, from grumpy old Gospel of Matthew. Enter through the narrow gate, 
for the gate is wide that leads to destruction, and there are many who will take it, for the gate is narrow and the road is hard that leads to life, and there are few who find it. A hard road indeed. Our economic growth, our economic system needs constant growth to survive. That means more and more exploitation of our natural resources, greater accumulation of wealth for the 1% at the expense of the 99%, most of whom are already struggling to survive. So the demand for justice will increase as one share of the pie decreases. And as we all know, the story of progress for all that we have gained includes tragic episodes of loss. We could talk a lot about what we seem to be losing in our environment, but I want to, as a, as a preacher and teacher of preaching, I, I'm worried about one natural resource being degraded as our story of progress unfolds. It's the resource that belongs to every one of you who preach. I'm talking about language. Our linguistic environment is experiencing its own climate change. Have you noticed how hot things have gotten when you talk about things that matter in public? What seems to be burning up is the capacity of words to carry meaning, particularly given our politics. Preachers, as preachers, you, you, you're already aware of, some, of the loss of some very good words like evangelism or witness or biblical or mission or even Christian. So to speak with authority about Jesus and justice, we need to recover, renew, and retranslate our language into the theological language that belongs to the tradition, into the concrete language of human experience, the living language of everyday speech, words that have some sweat on them. Just before uh, I moved to Tulsa to begin my time here on the faculty, I, I went to Cherry Log Georgia to visit with Fred Craddock. It was a bit like going to the mountaintop to talk to Yoda. <laughs> and there on his screen porch, sitting in rocking chairs, drinking some iced tea, I assure you it's just iced tea. The scene was seemingly idyllic, but the, the conversation quickly turned to this crisis of language. And I asked him, Fred, if you were going to start preaching these days, what would you do first? And he, without hesitation, said, language. I would have my students pay attention to how people put things into words. To turn a word like pretty to something like good looking. To turn a word like well, that's a hostile person into somebody that was mean looking. Why? Because even in a period of crisis, words still have power. They have the power to create images. They have the power to do things. And sometimes they have the power to do bad things. And we're seeing plenty of examples of that. But in the mouths of prophets like William Barber and the women that Ellen has brought to us today and yesterday, words and actions combine to become word of God. A word that does something, a word that unmasks the pretensions of the powerful. Words, if chosen carefully, can create images of justice. And like it or not, we live in a world that is now structured around visualizations. The eye is just as important as the ear in preaching these days. When I was coming in to uh, homiletics and teaching speech and preaching, we were learning that the ear was where the sermons started. 
It was true for that time, but now I believe the ear and eye can't be so easily separated because what we hear creates pictures. And the images that we see in our, in our mind's eye and in our experience create feelings. And out of the feelings come meaning. Fred was saying, I think, to me, with all the technology that we have available to us these days, please don't overlook the power that you have in your possession, the power of the spoken word, to speak on behalf of the Holy One. Reclaim that power to become incarnational in your speech by learning, di learning to use dialogue in your sermons. Imagine conversations Rather than talking about something, put us in the scene where real people are speaking. Put words in the mouths of biblical characters, characters from your stories. Don't just tell us about them. There will still be hunger with all of our technological advances and screens and cell phones and the like to hear, I believe, a live human being standing up in a room to speak with passion and conviction about things that matter. In fact, that's what our D-Men program in homiletics is about. Here's a shameless plug for it. You're welcome, Kathy. In the homiletics track, and in all the efforts that we do, not just in our D-Men program, the efforts that are for those who are working preachers in ministry, we want to prepare people to preach for the future church by learning where passion lies, how to speak with conviction about those things. And that's what we've been doing here over the last couple of weeks in an intense event called our fortnight. I pause to say fortnight, and you might think that it's like some quaint English garden somewhere sipping tea in the afternoon and discussing topics of the day while munching little biscuits. It's more like boot camp. We discuss topics all right, but if you know anything about our D-Men classes and our day-long M-Div classes, you know that a whole lot of munching goes along too. The snacking industry is making a killing off our students. Students come in with nuts and crackers and cheese sticks, no little biscuits unless you count the Fig Newtons. But we do so much more than that. We had our own experiences in our fortnight of reminding, reframing, and renewing. We reviewed, for example, our homiletical histories together. Some of us came into the formal study of preaching when that study was more about how we preach, about techniques of preaching. Now we have to be more concerned about what we say in our sermons. Preaching is not going to be transformative in our time if we only attend to how. In the song, Beautiful City, that we heard, we heard about what we need in order to build brick by brick. We may not reach the ending, but we can start Slowly but surely mending brick by brick, heart by heart, maybe now we start learning how. What are the bricks that build our theological framework, that build our, our foundation? Do you remember them from Joe's map in class you took? The topics of image of God, of sin, of Christ, church, especially attending to eschatology. And we learned in our, in our fortnight experience that not only does theological preaching attend to topics, but it also concerns how it is that we arrange sermons, how our sermons take shape and move. Do they move from trouble to grace, for example, from problem to solution? Are they shaped like thesis, antithesis, synthesis? Are they plotted like stories to create an experience of the gospel? 
Are the Jesus stories told so that a people can be formed to live them out and a community around those stories can emerge anew? Do they take us to the cross and end in celebration? Do sermons arise from a sacramental imagination to name where grace appears in the world? Is a sermon heard as God's human enfleshed speech? Or is God's speech understood as more of a whispered word? A whisper that urges us to take those steps together to get ourselves out of the messes that we're in. Are we preaching God's gospel or are we preaching a text? These are questions that belong to all of us. And if we're going to prepare to preach for the future church, we're invited to attend to them. Now, we covered a lot of territory in those two weeks, but at the end of the, at the, end of the fortnight, I was thinking, oh, shoot, I forgot to tell them about one of my favorite things. And that is, I didn't tell them about the city of homiletical wisdom. And it's not one that's out there in the future somewhere. It's right here. It belongs to everyone of you who preach. In the place where the homiletical wisdom resides in your life, the doors are open. Whenever the challenge presents itself, I have a hard task. The gates are open for you to enter the city of homiletical wisdom and walk around. So the question we would ask is, how do you preach on the way to the beautiful city? In order to do so, we've got to address the bumps in the road. So I, I encourage you to get to know the geography of your city of homiletical wisdom. Revisit its layout especially those streets and structures that are under constant construction. And if you live in Tulsa, you know all about that. Find out where the library is in your city. Is it still in the center of your life or has it moved? Is it still a library or has it become a multimedia center? What new resources are you adding to build and rebuild the beautiful city of your homiletical wisdom. That's always under construction. O over Christmas, I was thinking about this, thinking hard about my city of homiletical wisdom. And my wife, Amy, had tickets for us to go to the Monet exhibit at the Denver Museum of Art. I resisted. It would mean finding parking downtown. There'd be crowds. Besides, there might be some important football game that I wouldn't want to miss. The Cheese Whiz Monster Truck Frito Bowl, for example. <laughs> but if you know my wife, you know how it played out. I was the one driving. Yes, there was a crowd. Yes, parking was difficult and expensive. But it wasn't too long before I found myself in front of Monet. Speechless. Transported. Moved. And thinking to myself, oh, that my words could create such imagery to make human life so visible, so appealing so sacred. Something new had taken up residence in my city of homiletical wisdom, the artistry of Claude Monet. So I would say this, reflecting back on my encounter with this stunning art. When you set up an encounter with any of the arts, I urge you to take risks. Heed what Walter Wink said about parables. To hear a parable means to submit oneself to entering its world, to make oneself vulnerable, to know that we do not know at the outset what it means. It's good practice for when you're reading a biblical text. Or even more graphically, what Goethe said, 
We encounter the arts to impale our imaginations on the very things of earth. So, if we're going to preach our way to the beautiful city, we're going to have to find a rejuvenated language for preaching. Preaching that impales one's imagination on the very things of the earth. Again, I will quote Ursula Le Guin from an address that she gave in 2014. Resistance and change often begin in art, and very often in our art, the art of words. So I hope that this year you will take a closer look. Walk around in your city of homiletical wisdom. Look at it with new eyes. Who is it that's taken up residence in your city? Who is it that refuses to leave? What shape is the street in that goes from text to sermon? How about the line of communication that goes from your listener's ear to your voice? Is the line clear? Is there a place where you go in your city to simply listen? That theological critic who's been working as a traffic cop all these years, is it time for them to retire and employ someone new? The wells and the fountains that supply inspiration, are they filled with living water? How about your branch of the Manna Baking Company? Still supplying fresh bread for your congregation you're serving? And where in your city can you find the oldest piece of furniture in the world? Where you stop by to give thanks and ask for help? For that matter, how long has it been since you went to your city of homiletical wisdom to see what shape it's in? What needs repair? What needs reframing? If someone asks for, your, for directions, where do I find the place where Jesus' way makes justice streak? Would you know? Because I've been called to this work as a preacher and teacher of preaching, I, I can say that I keep up the maintenance pretty well, adding a book or two here, downloading a lecture there, trying to keep that avenue between text and sermon well-tended, in fact, um, I had the opportunity in my sabbatical recently to, to really look at the practice of storytelling and what it is that we as people who preach can learn from storytelling. And I found a new avenue for teaching and practicing storytelling opening up. I had spent a lot of time teaching people how to tell their own stories, but what I began to discover and what I was reading and studying was that right embedded in the process of telling and learning stories, there are some values that nourish the preaching life and may just help get us to the beautiful city. Values like these. You can't learn a story without listening to it. You can't share a story without having someone listen to you. It's a practice of active listening, of setting aside that which is going on in your mind and paying attention as a story unfolds, wherever that story is unfolding. There is among storytellers a predisposition to compassion, a willingness, and in fact, a desire to enter into the world of another and walk around and return, transform. And then in a, in a capitalist system that we live in that is doing everything to break apart connections, putting things in our hands that would make connection more difficult, the storyteller makes connection a priority. Because it is with between a teller and a listener that meaning is created and understood and shared. Transform. It's transformed. So I attended to that, but you know, even, even as I do 
regularly do maintenance in my city of homiletical wisdom, I also realize that there are places that suffer from deferred maintenance. And I came son, upon such a place when I was preparing this address. I used to spend a lot of time down in the theater district of my city of homiletical wisdom. In fact, there was a theater district before I knew there was a city of homiletical wisdom. Long before I was a student of preaching, much less a professor, I was a student of the theater. I spent a number of years formally studying theater that resulted in a Master of Fine Arts program at Trinity University through the auspices of the Dallas Theater Center. And the DTC, as I'll call it, had a euphemism for itself. It was called a place for our ideas. I wouldn't have been able to give voice to it, but I can say now that it was making an implicit theological claim about the image of God in humanity. It was an idea that human beings had a divine spark, that we all had potential to create, regardless of what medium we were using to create. The theater was just a place for exploration of that in my view, image of God in us, co-creating, participating actively in creating visions of human life and putting them on stage and watching them as texts come to life in production. But I didn't go to the Dallas Theater Center to study theology. I went because I was drawn to the power of performance, the way that words fixed on a page or on in the lines of a script come to life when they take shape and begin to come through the actor's art, the director's vision, the designer's plans. And yet, even still, even though it wasn't my primary objective, boy, it sure did trouble my theological framework particularly my received theology of the arts, and it started to come undone. When I went to the Dallas Theater Center, I had a carefully worked out and carefully framed theology of the arts, that the arts, especially theater, suspicious as it was, was useful to Christian faith only as it pointed to humanity's need for salvation the kind of salvation only available through Jesus Christ. Let's just say that kind of framing didn't last long. I'll tell you where it first began to break apart. It was in a play directing class, of all things. For our first assignment in directing, we had to take some of the raw materials of the director's art, not words, but things, elements like line, space, Rhythm, sound, nonverbal sounds, silhouettes, the shape of the actor's bodies in combination with, with each other, composition of stage pictures. We had to put all that together and put them into motion. Where we're not to tell a story, we were simply to put a group of actors into motion. Those pieces would be rehearsed among our peers, and then we would perform them for the class. Well, it was my day to present. The little ensemble was ready. They faithfully and skillfully performed as I had directed them. Fortunate, and frankly, I thought it was pretty good. In fact, I was moved by it. And as it unfolded, I looked around expecting everybody to wipe, be wiping their eyes. Then, during the response, the professor, Mr. Paul Baker, said, <clears throat> Mr. Ward has given us, pause for effect, a Fourth of July tableau within a Baptist allegory. And the missiles shot and destroyed 
my theological framework. <laughs> Mr. Baker was a good teacher, and so afterwards I went to him. What I wanted to say was, sir, that's not what I had in mind when I put that exercise together. I didn't realize it would come off like that. That's not at all what I wanted to communicate. Instead, what came out was, Mr. Baker, I don't understand. Please help. That was my first lesson in teaching, by the way. For a student to come to you and say, I don't understand. Please help. Something like that ever happened to you when you realized suddenly that your way of looking at the world just wasn't adequate? That what you were had been taught to believe wasn't, in fact, carrying what you intended to communicate? That the old wineskins just wouldn't do anymore to hold the new wine that you were receiving? Jesus said, new wine needs new wineskins, but where, Jesus, does one go to get new wineskins? Maybe they're not handed to you. Jesus doesn't answer. Perhaps we need to make them ourselves. Because I was stuck with a weirdly pious way of looking at the world, Mr. Baker instructed me to begin reading plays from the theater of the absurd. Those plays surfaced in the 50s in response to the horrors of World War II in Europe. One question that pulls these, this variety, wide variety of plays together is a philosophical one, is an existential one. How does one make sense of one's existence when the old certainties and religious orthodoxies collapse and the tools of communication break down? I was in that place. According to the critic of, to the critic of Martin Eslin, who, who is the, uh, uh, really coined the term theater of the absurd, he said that these plays aim to shock its audience out of complacency, to bring it face to face with the facts of the human situation as these playwrights see it. And what is that situation that they want to reveal? That human life is inherently without meaning. That there are no easy solutions to the mysteries of existence, say these playwrights. We humans, they claim, are alone in a meaningless world. That's where my building, shaping of new wineskins, otherwise known as constructive theology, began long before I attended seminary. I have the arts to thank for that. So before I finished my MFA, I had to direct a play and write about it. And so I chose an obscure play from the Theater of the Absurd called The Killer by Eugenie Inesco. I bet you can't wait to hear about that. A central image of that play is a city, a city of light, aptly named the Radiant City. The Radiant City is conceived to be a brand new housing project that features all the advantages of the technocracy, pleasant gardens, and a lovely pond. And when the play opens, a central character enters, a naive, everyman sort of guy, meant to remind us of Charlie Chaplin in the silent films. His name is simply Beringer. He's being shown around by another character known as the architect who points out to Beringer that in addition to the other features of the Radiant City, permanent sunshine is built in. In fact, the climate in the Radiant City doesn't change. It's always springtime. That's not how Denver is, I'll tell you right there. And in, in the Radiant City, Beringer is deeply moved. He never knew such a place existed. Oh, such a perfection of design the embodiment of all of my hopes for life, the ingenious result of careful city planning. But why, Beringer asked the architect, are these lovely streets so deserted? 
he learns to his outrage and his horror that a mysterious killer lurks in this happy place. People are so afraid that they have locked themselves in their houses or they've left the radiant city altogether. And the killer, this weapon of choice, is an absurd bit that, character, that characterizes this kind of theater. The killer lures people to their deaths by showing them the photograph of the colonel and pushing them into a pond where they drown. Beringer is appalled and righteously indignant when he's horrified to learn that even the architect's secretary, Mademoiselle Dany, with whom Beringer has quickly fallen in love, is one of the victims. And the quest begins. Beringer is off to find the killer, to bring him to justice. And the plot of the play is like a nightmare we've all had. When you want to get somewhere and you can't get there and people are in your way and they're saying things that you don't understand, well, all of that's on stage. Imagine trying to direct that. There, but Beringer finds evidence, even a briefcase that has the very implements that the killer uses in his nefarious campaign. Stacks and stacks of photographs of the colonel, the killer's diary, a map that marks the exact spots where the murder were committed. We have to go to the police. We have to go to the police. There's even an identity, uh, uh, the killer's identity card with his address on it. But how to find the police station? No one seems to know. No one seems to care that Beringer has overwhel overwhelming evidence of the killer's whereabouts. And to make matters worse, and to bring the images of this play right up to date, there is a political rally going on. A large woman with a commanding presence named Mother Peep is holding a rally. The play identifies her as the keeper of the geese. She's making a campaign speech to the cries of the crowd, long live Mother Peep, long live the geese. I'll let you read between the lines. Her speech is composed of totalitarian cliches. In a world after her victory, everything will be different. Lies will become truth. Truth will become lies. And yet, the substance of things will remain the same. Tyranny will be called liberty. Occupation will be called liberation. Long live Mother Peep. Long live her geese. Meanwhile, in the confusion, Beringer has lost the brief briefcase containing all the evidence needed to catch that killer. He tries to catch the attention of the police, but they are more interested in clearing the traffic jam that Mother Peep's rally has caused. And suddenly, he finds himself alone. He's walking through the empty streets. The radiant city is now far, far away. He's in a dreary part of town. And you know what happens next, don't you? Beringer finds himself face to face with the killer. A short, grinning, giggling figure, clothed in shabby clothes and oversized shoes and not so successfully trying to hide a large knife. Huh. So this is the killer that terrorized the radiant city. Valiantly, Beringer, our, our hero, mounts an argument to dissuade the killer from his murderous and senseless program of destruction. He appeals to every known argument for philanthropy and goodness, patriotism, self-interest, social responsibility, reason. Even at one part, he starts to preach to the killer. Christ died on the cross for you. It was for you he suffered. Jesus loves even you. And you really need to be loved, don't you? If Christ's love is not enough for you, I give you my solemn word. I'll have an army of saviors climbing new crosses just for you. They will be crucified for love of you. And through it all, the killer never speaks a word. He merely giggles idiotically. And in the end, as a last resort, Beringer pulls out two old guns to try to shoot the killer. But even then, he can't. He drops the guns, and as the killer moves in on him, giggling, Beringer opens his shirt, crying, Oh, God. He drops to his knees. There's nothing we can do. 
what can we do? The killer raises his knife, lights out. That's the way the play ends. With a question. What can we do? It's a cry of the heart. I don't know how many times I've asked myself that question recently. In the face of the senseless, giggling evil that sends, sends to approach and no, that, that approaches and doesn't seem to be anyone knows what to do about it. Unresponsive to my appeals to reason, faith, love of country even, our ideals of freedom, our national institutions, common sense. To stop. Just stop the killing. What can we do? Then in my reflection, a story surfaces that also asks a question. Jesus told them a parable why they should keep on praying and not to lose heart. There was, in a certain city, a judge, an unjust judge, who cared nothing at all for God or for anyone. And there was also in that city a widow who came to the judge night and day, demanding justice against her opponent. For a long time, the judge refused, but she persisted. Finally, the judge relented. Yes, it's true that I care nothing for God and have no respect for humanity. I will give this person justice, otherwise she will bother me to death with all of her pleadings. And Jesus said, do you hear what that unjust judge said? And will not God grant justice to God's beloved if they cry day and night? I tell you, God will grant justice. But when the human one comes, will faith be found on earth? 